Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to our channel. What's the topic of pen? I am your co-host Deborah Love. The other co-host Amaria Love is right across over here. And this is going to be a solo um, podcast because I'm going to be doing my perspective of working from home. I've been doing this for a few years and I just decided I just want to go with some of the things that I felt that was okay and maybe not okay as far as working from home but it's all good I'm still working from home so I found something that suits me but we'll get into that a little bit more after the break yeah you're the co-host Imar you love aka Mars on the internet will be asking me some questions I wrote down some things for her and she's going to ask me some questions and we're going to take it as if it's an interview for me, as far as working from home, from my point of view. All right, so uh, being an insurance agent, how was that for you anyway? Okay, so one of my first jobs I had working from home was being an insurance agent with this company. Um, and the thing about that, of course, if you know, if you're an agent, you have to be licensed in your state in order to sell life insurance and health insurance or any other type of insurance as far as if you're a real estate agent, uh, if you doing property and casualty. So my thing was life, accident, and sickness, or life, sickness, and accident, however it went. I still have my insurance license as well. Even though we moved, I, st- I had to take the test again when I got here. That's a whole other story. But working from home as an insurance agent, one of the things that I disliked about it is cold calling. I don't like to try to... I didn't like trying to get someone on the phone and really pressuring them into buying insurance from me. I always felt like if somebody wanted insurance, they'll call you and they'll ask you for it. Most of the people like to get the things in the mail, read over it, and then make their decision. Some people don't like just going through the entire process over the phone. Some of them do. You know, many people do buy things over the phone, but... I just didn't like having to call them and then getting hung up on, people cursing you out. You know, uh, we did have a script, but you had to be kind of like pretty quick with it and really, really know the script in order to, as they say, come back, have your rebuttals um, at the top of your mind as, as well. If someone said that I don't have time and then you say just give me a minute and let me talk to you about, this life insurance policy and what it can do for your family at their time of needs, then maybe they'll give you that minute. So most people don't see the value in the life insurance policy, but they do have policies out there that you can use while you're still alive. So those were some of the things that people will really gravitate towards because most of the time when people think about life insurance, they're thinking about, that's going to be the money that you're going to use in order to put that individual away. So you can also have policies that you can put in place whereas if you need it, you have a terminal illness, then you can start drawing down from your life insurance policy. If you have a $20,000 policy and you have an illness and they feel like that it qualifies for you to take some money from that policy, it probably would allow you to take five, ten thousand $10,000 from that policy. It just depends on how long you had it in order to do it. Another thing, as a life insurance agent, I was working off a commission. Life insurance policies, those commissions pays very well. It just all depends on the insurance company that you work for because some of them, they will pay you the amount of the premium that the, the person is getting paying for the entire year. Say, for instance, if the premium was $40, $40 times 12, 480 so you would end up with a $480 commission. Sometimes they give you that 100%. Sometimes they give you 60 80%. And then after the person has that policy in place for so many months, then they'll give you the other part of the commission. Where people go in and they make a large amount of, on a commission, they probably can go in and insure the entire family. If you're insuring the husband, the wife, and the four kids, then you're basically going to walk away with a pretty good commission. The thing about it is if 
that person drops the policy early or don't keep it, then they have things called chargebacks, and you will have to pay that money back. That was the only thing that I didn't like about with those commissions. You have to make sure that you got somebody who have a stable job that's going to take that life insurance policy seriously as if it's something that they need. They take that as a priority when they're paying their monthly bills. Then you know that for sure that you're going to be able to hold on to the commission that individual that you got from selling that policy. You'll be able to keep it and not have those chargebacks. That's that's what gets you. But they said. Don't worry about the chargebacks that happen. Just keep on selling, selling, selling. But you got to still keep putting yourself out there and try to call people, going over to the house, knocking on doors. It, it was, I, that was just not the job for me. It was not the ideal job for me. But people who do it, kudos to them because I know I've known people who too have made thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars a year selling life insurance policies or mortgage protections too mortgage protection plans I've done that as well it's just all about what you want to do and the honesty in it when you're doing things like that um I will ask this question that is not on this paper mm -hmm. but more a sense of how long have you been uh doing insurance yeah I've, I've had my license I've had my license since 2017 so seven years seven years well I mean it's for it's selling the last time I sold insurance was in 2019. So now I use my license basically on, for the other, we can segue into the other um, job, not my first one. I know you're looking at my first one that I, I had as far as working for a company, company from home. Um, but I use my accident and sickness part, the health aspect of my um insurance license as far as doing Medicare. I'm a trainer for Medicare. So one of the jobs that I've had was selling Medicare, Medicare policies. And what I liked about that better was the people were calling in. So that's calling in. They was asking about their plans, making sure that the coverage was still there when they went to see their doctors, making sure that the medication was still covered if they got any new medications. And then you want to make sure that the plan is is still there that's going to best suit their needs. We want to make sure of that. So as being a Medicare agent, you are getting paid by the hour. So you was going to get paid regardless of whether you, you made a sale or not that day. But that company wanted to make sure they were a numbers cruncher. So they wanted to make sure that those sales was done. And I just And being me and the integrity that I have, I want to make sure that I'm not trying to upsell somebody on something in the plan that they're already in. It's suitable for them. So that thing right there for me, it still just goes back to integrity when you're doing things. Because you look at that aspect, when you think about Medicare, you're thinking about people that 65 years or older, people that's disabled, um, people probably just um, maybe on a disability and they still under the age of 65. And then they can still qualify for Medicare and Medicaid. So those are called the dual status people. And with them then and having those medical conditions, the policies are, the plans really, I'm going to say policy, the plan is pretty, really, really good for someone that's dual status. So I like, I like doing those because I always put my mom in mind when I am talking to an individual on the phone because when they get to that age, they really don't have too many people their own age that they really communicating with, and they really have to depend on that person that they're talking to on the phone to make sure they understand what they're getting into and to explain that to them because they, this company have had children to call and counsel the plan because they're saying that um, the individual was being taken advantage of because no one was there with them when they did that. They didn't want them to uh, do it. That's when you have your power of attorney or your custodians over you when it comes down to an elderly parent. And I understand that. I understand that. But most of the time, when you, you, we do ask questions like that. So most of the time, they say, oh, yeah, I make my own decisions. And then a child will step in and say they don't. 
and then they want to come in and just drop the policy. So that happens, and that's where, when you work for companies like that, and you, an agent on the phone selling those Medicare plans, that's why those commissions are so small. They probably get maybe $20, $30 per sale if they're getting that much, and then they wait until the end of the season to give it to them just to make sure that those policies stick or make sure that those people just probably going to hang around just to get that, that money at the end of the season. But I did that for one season, and then maybe a year went by, and then they called me. They called me. Someone called me and asked me, was I interested in becoming a trainer? So to train the agents to sell the policies. And I say, yeah, so I interviewed for that. So that's what I've been doing for the past. This will be my third season if they call me back as far as being a trainer for the upcoming season starting, I want to say October 15th, I think. If I'm not mistaken, it'll be October 15th when it does start up, um, the annual enrollment period. And then it will end on December 7th. So it's it's a job. You just take them through that training um, and just get them prepared to, to get on the phones. It's, it's the thing about it. Now, one thing that I would tell anybody when you're working from home, you have to have some computer skills. Unless it's a work-from-home job, whereas you only, you're not on the phones. Because most of the times when you're on the phones, you're going to have to be able to navigate from one system to the next. You're going to have to be able to follow a script that they're giving you, you got to be able to hold a conversation with that individual, and then you're going to have to be able to open up another maybe software in order to enter the information for that policy. So it's, you got to have some computer skills because it's like software built inside of the computer just for you to work from that company. Most companies will give you, I know the companies that I work for, they send me a laptop. Now, one company that I work for, they did not send a laptop, but they was downloading the stuff, the software on my computer, and my computer crashed. It really crashed. It's like it was a virus from their software that was on my computer, and it, it didn't get, I basically had to just reboot or just, delete everything off my computer and just reset it to factory settings in order to get my computer back. So you just really have to be careful. I'd rather use their computers, their laptops, instead of using my own personal stuff. The only personal things that I use to help me out and better so I can be more productive when I'm working from home is I have extra monitors so I can pull things from one screen to the next because it helps me out a lot. I have two monitors as well as their laptop, but sometimes I feel like I need a third monitor. I really do. But right now, the two works out a lot because one screen is so big, whereas I can break it down side by side, and, and it can really expand down as if it is another monitor. So I like that as well. Okay, so um, talking about... You were talking about training, getting mm -hmm. paid training in the first place. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, how was that? Enjoy it? Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah. As, far, yeah. as far as, and that's an incentive for people, too. As long as I'm being paid while I'm being trained, I can sit there with you for 10 hours because I'm getting paid. So I don't worry about that. So make sure you find somebody that's willing to train you for the position. I'm not going to say that you're going to learn everything in training because that's the way it is with a real job. I won't say a real job, but a job away from home where you have to actually commute and go to a building. You, they train you so much, but there's some other things that you're going to learn while you're on the job. And that's the same way we work from home. All the training that I've done when I became a trainer for the Medicare company, I, I think from June to, it was almost like a, like a three-month training. But it's a three-month tra paid training. I got paid every week. I didn't mind doing that. So, you know, that, that was something good. So make sure that the paid training is there. And sometimes they'll pay you a little bit lower amount when you're training. And then once you actually get into production, then they probably bump it up a dollar or two. 
So that's some things that you have to look at when you're looking at those work-from-home jobs. I always looked at a work-from-home job that was training. Sometimes it's four weeks of training, five, six weeks of training, but it's still worth it just to get up and uh, get ready, log into your computer, and do things. I know some people, one of the things that I hear a lot is I'm not going to get in and log in 15 minutes early or start 30 minutes early and I'm not getting paid. I beg to differ on that part because I want to make sure that all of my systems are working. I want to make sure that my internet is going when I get up in the morning. So sometimes it does take getting up 15 or 30 minutes until you 30 minutes until you get used to the, the software. And once you get used to the to the software and those apps that's built into the software in order for you to do your job, then maybe five, ten minutes and you're good to go. I know one job allows they said it's okay for you to sign in or clock in five minutes early. Another job said it's okay for you to clock in fifteen to thirty minutes early. So just take advantage of what they're giving you, and if it takes a minute, because you got to get used to a certain system. Sometimes I know with the Medicare job, you had to log in a certain way in order for the system to communicate with each other. If you didn't log in that way, your headset wasn't working when you got ready to take phone calls. You couldn't hear anything, and then you call in the tech support team, and they're going to ask you, which way did you log in? Or are you into this system? And they will say no. So now you got to log out and start all over again. So I used to give them and still give them the steps to log in every day when you're in training, and then it's steps for you to log in when you get into production. But I try to give them the same thing in training as well as in the production so then it will not be anything new to them when they get ready to get into production. So. It's just a, a matter of learning those systems. I know with that Medicare company, it is so, I think it's maybe five or six steps for you to get logged into the system every day. And with the job that I have right now, the first thing I make sure that I do with my job right now is clock in so I can get paid. My manager told me every single time that you sit down at this computer and you get ready to go to work, the first thing that you do is clock in. So once I clock in, then I start opening up my different systems, I set, my, set myself active, and then I'm ready to assist. So it's, you got to have some computer skills. I would tell anybody that. I mean, you just, you have to have it because it's so many new, they have Slack for one company that I work for, and that's how they communicate with. And then with the other company, they use Microsoft Teams. I work for a company that use Adobe. You know, so you just have to be really familiar with these different systems. Some, some of them you log into Zoom. Some of them they want to do the Microsoft team thing. So you have to log in and you in a Teams meeting. So that was one thing I had to learn with Microsoft. I didn't know, I knew how to, I was very, very familiar with Zoom, but I wasn't that familiar with setting up Microsoft Teams meetings. So what did I do? I go to YouTube. Because some people say, well, well, just send me a link to your, your um, teams, and then I, I, can, I, can, I can join the meeting. So I had to go in, and I just had to do that and learn. I don't mind telling anybody I go to YouTube to find things because they have everything. If someone done posted something that you're trying to I just look up some weird stuff, and I guarantee somebody posted it. They're just bottom line. Any other questions? I know I'm glistening over here. All right, we'll be back after this break. Uh, talk about a little bit more on your second job when it comes to uh, missing calls and stuff like that and not making a sale every day or you had to make oh, one and stuff yeah. like that. That job too much, but it is what it is. This job. If you, they, granted, you're getting paid by the hour, and I was one of those people, and I'm getting paid by the hour, but, you know, forget it. I'm not, I'm not worried about making a sale because I'm going to get paid regardless of what. So, And some days you, when you make a sale, because they, they are looking at numbers, they are looking at, and then like they have 
supervisors that competing with each other and seeing how many people make sales for the day and then you got the big hoorah about who doing what as far as um doing their thing so at that time when i did it and it's still just understand it was one of my first work from home jobs so you really don't know what the expectation is and how everything is going to function when you're in training everything is just like Oh, I'm in training. Okay, I'm learning this and that. And then when you have to be on the phones, that's going to be totally different. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to take what I learned from training and apply it to the phone. But it's still, it was a different beast for me. I just did not, about anybody, for the first time. And you're talking about you on the phone. You got a headset on. You're not used to something ringing in your ear and then you hear a whisper and telling you, you know, you got an incoming call or whatever. My heart was beating like. <laughs> Take that like 10 times. <laughs> it was beating hard. And I was like, wow. And then the first call came in. And then you said, thank you for calling and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like. Oh. And then I'm hearing a person. Then I'm like, okay, now I got to, I got to follow the script. And I got to make sure that I'm typing. And I got to make sure that I'm doing this and that. It was just like, ugh. It, it's, it's crazy. It, it, you really, really have to maintain that composure. Really understand that person don't know you. You don't know them. And just take the call. But it was still navigating those systems at the time. It was just like, okay, I, I can see them on the screen, I got this open up, and they tell me to do this right here. You did it, you did it well, and when you're in training, now this is real, you know? And it took me a few calls to get comfortable, but it still was like, whew, I got, I got to get through this again. Okay, that call is over with. Let me get to the next call. So you had to go through that all over again until you could come. By the time I was coming, that, it was, the ship was over with. My, my heart was pounding. I'm like about to have a heart attack out here trying to answer the phones and make this Mernie's. But I did it. I did it. I did it. But I can tell you one thing. Answering the phone is not for me. That is just not for me. I could not just do that all the time. I, it's just like, uh-uh. I'd rather chat with you than be on the phone. That's just me. Now, I can chat the daylight side. I can get back with you. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got that. I got that. So I can do all that stuff. I, I'm fast at typing. I, I can chat. That was really, I was really, really good at that part. If I had to get back on the phone again, so I just want to chat. I don't think I want to just get back on the phone. Just put me in a chat room, and I'll chat it up. But it was just, it was an experience. Now, another company that I worked for, and it may have been my first work from home job. I think I skipped that one. My first work from home job. They did training, but then once you got in there, they wanted to do like some quick one week training, and it was just too much. I quit that job. I don't even think I told my family I quit that job. I faked like I was getting up, going to work every morning, going to my office. I was sleeping. <laughs> I didn't do that. I really did. I, I couldn't do it. It was like it was just too much. That one right there, I didn't even have, I don't even think I had a second monitor for that job. And it was just too much to try to navigate, Ten you split screens. And, and it was not like you was working with one company for, this was, this was one where I was working for a company and I had to help people find new plans employee health plans, health care plans. So it may have been someone calling that worked at Nike. It may have been someone calling that worked from a school system. It may have been someone calling that was a veteran. It could have been someone calling maybe even working from Amazon. I don't know. They had so many vendors that they were working with. It was just crazy. So navigating those systems was just, it was just too overwhelming for me. I said, forget it. I, I sent them a, a resignation letter, and I quit. And I, and I ain't never worked for that company again. We don't, we don't hire quitters. 
So they call me back. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know what they said or not, but we, we ain't going to call you back for another round. But I, I did get something from them the other day. Now, I, I think they done, they got me mixed up in their stuff. They don't even realize it. But, yeah, I, could, I couldn't do that anymore. Nope. Okay, then let's talk about your uh, third job anyway, which is your most recent one, and how much you enjoy it the most out of, like, the other ones. Okay, so the, the job that I work with now is it's in my wheelhouse. I, I have a background in accounting, so and I do tax returns. So when it came to that, the crazy thing about this job was the first year, that I got interviewed for the position, they asked me, did I prepare a certain amount of returns per year? And I told them, no. So they said, well, we're um, looking for people who've done over 100 returns um, for the tax season, and since you haven't, then, you know, I didn't qualify for the position. I'm like, okay. And I just, I left it alone. And maybe a month later, they called back. They said that they had went back and revised the qualifications for the job and asked me was I still interested and I told them yeah and I came in as a tax associate so yet again I was back on the phones but the thing about it they had paid training it was self self paced training but you still had to be done with it by a certain period of time so they can get you on the phones and still yet again my first phone call my heart was beating out of my chest but I was able to see the screen that the person was seeing. So once I can see their screen, I'm familiar with the software for this tax company. I didn't have a problem with it. It was just that you don't know what question you're going to get. You don't know what issue the person is having in order to resolve that issue. They did have a script as well, but it was just really, really a short script. So I was fine with uh, doing that. And they gave you a bonus at the end of the year. Every year with this company, every year you get a new contract, they give you a pay increase. So the pay is good. It's just that you, you need to have some type of tax background in order to get in. I know with some people they don't really have a big tax pack, big tax background, but they were able to get in as assistants and not as associates. So they still, you still continue to train it throughout the tax season. And I really, really love this company. And I can, I, this is my fourth season working for them. So I've gone from tax associate to full service tax expert to uh, a lead support, a tax support lead or a lead. So now I'm not on the phone. I did my two years as being on the phone, and this is my second year as far as being in this lead role. And I'm really enjoying it because I'm helping people that are on the phones. So we just do a lot of research. It's a lot of tax knowledge. It's people in a Zoom room assisting each other. And then we assist in the experts that's on the phone. So I love it. I really do. And I tell them that all the time. So it starts so quick and for that time frame. And then before you know it, they're like right now, it's right around the corner in about three weeks. Then that'll be over with. And I'll be starting on another adventure that she has hyped me up for today, gave me a little motivational speech. So I'm going to get in and start working on that. I'm going to give myself like a two-week, I'm going to take a two-week vacation, give myself about two or three weeks after this season is over with, and then I'll start doing some other things. But it's, it's been excellent working from home because I like the fact with me, and she can tell you, this is how I am. And this, this put me in the mode, and I can tell anybody that that's what you want to do. Most people feel like, oh, you work from home, you can get up, you can get up, you can go walk around, you can go wash dishes, you can cook a meal, you can wash your clothes. No. One company that I work for, you have to be on camera. That is their policy. And some people want to put, I know the first season I think I worked, and this young lady, she had her camera facing the ceiling. And they were like, well, you have to be on camera. Some people be like in a dark room just to not be on camera. And granted, I was one of those individuals that did not like to be on camera, 
But as Eric the hip hop preacher says, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That is one of my motivational things. So once I got comfortable with that, I didn't even worry about it. I had to tell agents every season, you need to be on camera, you need to be on camera, and they do not like that. Somebody kind of, uh, I can't be on camera because my camera's not working today. I can't be on camera because uh, they didn't send me a camera. I can't be on camera because I don't know where it is. It, it's a whole lot of excuses. Just be on camera. You want to get paid? That's their policy, and I'm sure you learned, learned about it. I will say just showtime and show up. And that's what I do. I don't worry about it. I just talk. I get on there. I do what I have to do, and you you going to have to talk. Now, that's one job. The other job, they want you in the room, or it's really not a requirement to be on Zoom, but you get your best help when you're on Zoom. You're more productive when you're in the Zoom room. So now we have avatars. So you create your avatar, and you on, you on camera with your avatar. Now when the manager comes in the room, then everyone turn the avatar off, and then she can actually see us in the room. So I don't have a problem with that either because I get up every day. I take a shower. I put on clothes as if I'm going to a brick and mortar to go to work. If I don't do that, it makes me feel, you know, like I'm not going to a job. But I get up, and that's what I do. I have to do it. It wakes me up. And when I get on camera, I'm ready. I'm all flawless like this, like I am right now, and I'm on camera. So that's what I do every day. It's what's fun. You know the question? Uh, I would say more sense of, and these are just my own personal questions, okay. people. So more sense anyway, uh, if you would uh, probably tell anybody that wants to like probably start doing insurance probably what's like the top three top five things that you probably would say to somebody if you go get in this field these are probably like my top things that you probably need for sure for sure first of all to get into insurance as far as life insurance because that is the best commission as far as life insurance especially if you're going to be an individual producer you're going to have to have your state license so your first thing was to make sure that you go to your department of insurance website for the state and look at their requirements most states uh as far as passing the test 70 percent i know this was that's how it was in the state of louisiana here i think it was 70 percent as well but one thing i like about louisiana when i fail those tests and i fail a couple of times when i fail the louisiana um life insurance test, I think I was taking life and health. When I failed that, I knew what I failed with. In the state of Georgia, and thank the Lord, thank you Jesus, I studied. And you can tell them I studied. I studied so hard because I didn't want to pay. I didn't want to pay. I thought I heard somebody knocking. Oh, you got to cut that out. But I, I studied hard because in the state of Georgia, you have to pay if you don't take the life and health exams together, then you have to pay to take the life exam and come back and pay again and pay and take the health exam and then go back and do your fingerprinting and that's paying. So just be prepared to be out about three hundred dollars right off the top. It's for as this because you're gonna have to pay the state to to take the state exam. You're gonna have to pay someone in order to study for the exam. So they have like um, what they call it, pre-licensing, a pre-licensing program. So you're going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to pay to take the exam. You have to also pay to get fingerprinted. And you're going to have to then pay the state to get your license. And so I know I was out about Two, three hundred dollars just to take it. I, let me tell you what I did wrong. In Louisiana, I was transferring my Louisiana license to Georgia, didn't realize that it was a certain period for me to get with the Georgia Department of Insurance in order to get that done. And 
I was sti- I still had a non-resident license in Louisiana, but I ain't had no license in Georgia. I'm like, what the what? And they said, you got to take this license, you got to take this exam all back over again. I'm like, what? And now I got to study. So who I used for my pre-licensing was AD Banker. There's some other companies out there too, but that's what I used when I first became a licensed agent in Louisiana. So AD Banker worked for me. And they were pretty reasonable. And then, you know, you take so many tests, 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 tests. And then I think with them, they had like 100 question tests, 200 question tests. And they kept on, I just kept going through those questions over and over and over and over and over again. So by the time that I went and um, I set up to take the exam in, here in Georgia, I don't know what it was. Only thing the lady said is congratulations. You passed the test. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Because it was like, it was like, you really, really, I can tell you, with those questions, it may be one or two questions that you may be familiar with. That's, that's just me and my perspective. It was just that you had to really know the information because they can word the question, and it, one, one word in the question could be wrong. This and, this or, you know, it, it could be wrong. So just, and it's, it's a lucrative um, job if that's what you want. I mean, you really, really, I would say you really have to, oh, so that, that now they have, you know, you can, you can buy leads from companies. They got lead generating companies. You can, you can buy leads from companies. Um, they have, I think the most expensive leads are the ones that, People are really looking, and they probably will buy from you. And some people will buy leads, but that's five, ten dollars a lead. But I don't know. I've done that before, and it was almost like you want to make sure that you get your money back. If you spend like twenty-five, thirty dollars on the lead, you want to get your money back from that. So it's just to me, it's really it's a, a hustle. It's I won't even say hustling because you're not hustling. This is life insurance. It's a commitment. That's basically what it is. You're going to have to be committed to making so many phone calls a day, doing so many appointments, or making so many sales. You, you, you're just going to have to commit to it. And I was just not that individual to make that commitment. Just being on the phone, dialing, 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 hoping someone answer, hoping some, someone is there. And if, if they say call me back, just it was just a lot. So Deborah Love was not that person for that. I just rather somebody, I, I'm, I'm seriously, I can take an incoming call with my heart beating out of my chest knowing that someone wants to look for that information than having to call somebody to see if they did remember sending in the postcard in order to get it or going online doing that in order for someone to call them to get a policy. Because if you all know, and I know some of you do know, if you go on the internet and you put your information in for a certain things, you're going to start getting phone calls back to back. Different people are going to be calling you. You can just be calling and just getting the insurance quote and all these people are going to be calling you from different insurance companies. That's what it's all about. So I, I just was, it was just not cut out for me. Okay, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. So another question I probably have for you, for instance, is um, for someone that did uh, try to work on commission, and we obviously has stated in the somebody already stated in the she don't like that. Miss Deborah Love don't like that. So no, I don't <laughs> like the more sense of um, with people that you have heard that obviously makes big bucks yeah. off of it. Can you more sense elaborate more on that, especially? Those people that I know have that really, really is successful in doing it, they have a sales background. And see, I never was in sales. I don't have that sales background. And I know one young lady who do very well. I think she worked for a state farm or something. you know. And that's what she did when she was at state farm. So you learn how to listen to the tone of the person that you're talking to. You learn how to take those pauses when you're talking to that individual. So it... It, it's, it takes patience, and then it's a, 
learning experience. It's, it's going to take time in order for you to get to that point. And I know with me, I don't know, I just, I just feel like, okay, this person's sending this postcard, this person uh, putting this information online, why didn't I answer my phone call? And then they want you to be in there and just constantly calling, calling, calling. And that was just not for me. But I guarantee you, and I can tell you this, my sales with them, it was just my most commission that I got from them because I knew rent was due. And I had to make some sales. So that commission check paid rent and paid my car note. You can do that if that's what you want to do. And you being independent, so you being an independent contractor with an insurance company. So just do your homework with the ones that you want to work with and see how it goes because it's always going to be someone training you in order to get to their level. So I would just say just make sure that you do your research as far as being an independent contractor. Some people just want to be an independent contractor and just be on their own. Then you have to find your own leads. Then you... Just have to make those sales. And some companies, if you don't make sales with them, then they just drop your contract. I know. It happened to me. So it is. It is a good. I mean, you got people. Just Can you imagine somebody making $30,000 in commission a month? A month? You can make a six-figure salary in seven months? I take that back. $30,000? No, you, you had a six-figure salary in four months. But you're on the phone. You're making a lot of phone calls. And that's every day. That's, that's like a seven-day-a-week thing. So you have to think about that. If you're, gonna, you're really going to work that hard and that's what you want to do, you got to put in that time in order to do it. It's not for me. I keep saying it. It's not for me. Not for me. <laughs> So to end this round off anyway of me talking because you basically got all the bulletin points or at least I made you get all the bulletin points up in here. So I would say last thing because like I said once again you sporadically talked about this during the whole podcast mm-hmm. about working from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you had to put a step by step process for somebody if they want to work from home and just, you know, being comfortable or having a routine regimen, what would you put in some of those steps? First of all, you're going to have to make sure that you have a separate space that's quiet. You have a desk set up. Most of the companies want you to have your router where it's going to be hardwired, so you're going to have an Ethernet cord running from your router to their computer, so that no, they know that it's safe that way. Um, I would definitely say you definitely have a desk space. Definitely have, I know with me, I have bottles of water. I have snacks in my desk as well on the days that I, um, I work. You have to make sure that you're in a quiet space because I know they give you headsets that's um, noise, that cut down on the noise. They give you those type of headsets. But me... I didn't feel like they were the most lucrative ones for me or, or the best fitting ones because I always, I just go buy my own. I go to Walmart and I buy my own. Um, the companies that I worked for wanted you to have two keyboards, one that went straight into the um, laptop, and then they wanted you to have an external mouse as well that went straight into the laptop. They give you these hubs as well, so just be prepared for that. But make sure that you have a good internet provider because mine, it shuts down on me a few times. I mean, I can be talking and all of a sudden my my computer shuts down because my internet, it goes out. (laughs) Right, right. So the internet goes out. So make sure you have a real good internet system. Uh, Yeah. And if you have some that you can choose from, I know most companies don't want you to go with like a Verizon, because they knew and they may not have that system set up the way an AT&T or a WOW or a DirecTV, those companies that have been out a while, a while, a while to have that fiber optic system and stuff, but they still want to make sure that 
it's hardwired. When they say hardwired, they talk about Ethernet cord running from your router to their their uh, laptop. Make sure that you are going to be focused. You're working for somebody. they paying you. Some companies start off $20, $30 an hour. Um, somebody probably said, who pays $30 an hour? Trust me, I know. Some companies will, will pay you that amount. You will just probably have to build your way up to it. But I do know that a company that I did work for, they did start me off at $20 an hour. So, and that was, I can tell you, that was the Medicare company. So they did start me off at $20 an hour. So that's, that's still pretty good. Make sure that I know some people, when you're on camera, it's just you. Because I've seen some people being on camera and the keys in the background or you, or they in a the living room or they in the kitchen. It's that, and trust me, that, that is not a problem if you at home by yourself. If you're at home by yourself, you can have your office space set up in the kitchen, set up in the living room. You're at home by yourself. So you don't have to worry about that background noise. But if you working from home like I do, and I have other people in the household, my office space is the best space for me. I can, I can get there and I can close the door. I can put my headset on and then I'm working. I don't have to worry about that. I know at times when I was working, I had to put something on the door that say, I'm working, don't come in here. Because some people will bust in there and want to talk. I'm working. So you have to make sure that they know that. This is a job. This is bringing money into the household, and I'm going to have to be professional with it. You have to be a professional while you're working. They're paying you. And it's this, this right here that I have is a good job, but I'm not, I'm not saying none of the people, none of the company names that I'm working for because I don't know. You know, I haven't got approval to say anything about them on the podcast as far as me working for them, so I'm not going to do that. And I don't know how that will fall because I ain't got no money for nobody to be suing me about anything. No way. So I just keep that, keep that part private. Take a break, and we're going to end the podcast. I want to thank you all so much for watching um, and listening to what I had to say as far as working from home. Again, this is just from my perspective. It's not from anyone else. I haven't interviewed anybody. This is from me and what I have done with the companies that I work for. It's two companies that I work for twice a year, and I thank the Lord that I've been blessed enough to have those companies to keep coming back, asking me to come to them for the past three years. So, And it, it allows me to really sometimes be off for the entire summer. So I, I really enjoy that. But really, thank you um, so much. You can listen to uh, our podcast episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, of course. So please go check out our website at www.whatsthetopicagain.com. And you can check out our blog page on the things that um, we've covered so much. Things that we covered as far as this season and so much more is out there, especially on our website. So Hope to see you guys next week. Bye.